morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you're coming from. So uh, welcome to my presentation on uh, living on the edge, which is an idea that um, came up about a year and a half ago with a customer who was looking for a way to connect branch offices to a centralized um, place. Back then, they were doing, trying to do it with OpenStack, and it didn't work very well, and the customer ditched the idea. But I thought it had merit, so I did some development and playing around with it uh, on my own. So here's a uh, uh, disclaimer, lawyers, you know. The, so the idea is to build small devices that can be placed pretty much everywhere. This here happens to be a Raspberry Pi, but it's not, I mean, this is a, this is a toy for, for development. The idea is, for instance, to have a rugged service that you can place in a branch office that can that only have to be plugged in, where you do not have to have local personnel who don't know anything about computers as long as they can plug in the power, power into the uh, power outlet, um, and you have a way to network connect the whole thing then you would be working. This thing has been, I've connected this um, at home, at my hotel room, everywhere. And the whole mechanism that is behind it works everywhere, everywhere. It doesn't uh, require um, me to know the IP address of the device. Uh, I, uh, it works from behind a firewall, pretty much anything, as long as I can uh, create a network connection to it. So, of course, if you are putting devices in places where they are potentially, um, could potentially be attacked. There's always risk factors. So the idea is here also to protect from, um, for instance, a listener on the Wi-Fi. Um, you know how weak Wi-Fi protocols are. Um, so we want to uh, create an environment that you, that you can safely, where you can safely uh, deploy software from your from your centralized environment to the edge device or devices, hopefully many of them, uh, and uh, um, run them there without having to uh, have any kind of IT knowledge in the in the area. So. Well, where could we use something like that? As we said, branch offices, um, for instance, point of sale software, something in this direction. Equipment sites, if you want to run simple network functionality uh, on, an, uh, let's say, wind turbine or something like that. Um, mobile sites, something that uh, may have different connectivity um, depending on where you are. Set-top devices, if we were to build out something, something that is some um, you know, home, uh, home control or something like that. The idea is really that we need to only know, uh, only have to have power and some form of network connectivity, something, and either 5G or um, Ethernet or Wi-Fi or whatever connectivity you have uh, available in the area. And uh, as this, the way that this is built at the moment, it does not have redundancy. The idea is um, if it should break, it's just going to be replaced with another device. So we, uh, to, you could, of course, build a, build a Kubernetes cluster. You could have multiple machines and uh, tolerate failure of one. The downside to that, of course, is that then again, you have more complexity and you potentially do not have um, a way to address this complexity where the device actually lives. So the idea is um, to not trust the local network at all or trust it for only uh, environment, uh, for only uh, traffic that does not have to do with the control of your Kubernetes environment. So the way that this is configured at the moment uh, is the tunnel is absolute. So all the traffic goes through the tunnel and it will automatically uh, get where it is. It cannot be, um, no, nobody can log in uh, uh, locally. Nobody it can uh, hijack the connectivity. This is, uh, this is um, unless of course you find a bug in an open, uh, uh, an open VPN to, uh, that uh, allows you to get in there. But uh, this is a risk that you always take, of course. So. Um, the thing is also, the idea is to have no login to the edge device. 
there's no SSH keys on it, no um, SSH permission, so people cannot do this. The, the SSH device is on, the, the edge device is only supposed to offer the service it's a, it, it is built for. Then uh, we have uh, local traffic optional. This would be, for instance, if we were to um, have a port that allows connectivity to things like a point of, point of sales register or so. And then um, admin tooling that would, do, would be on the uh, remote side of the of their environment. So, um, what do you what do we need? We only want power, and we want to have some sort of networking. We want to be able to ship this to the customer. This is um, actually the software for this is on an, an, on a USB key. This is a not not, a, not even a bad approach for even for something that is uh, going to be. Um, used in, a, in an actual function instead of just as a demo. Uh, although in uh, many cases, um, it would probably make more sense to have a USB drive because USB keys do not have any kind of error correction. So if this thing were to fail, we would replace it with a new one. Um, if you want to update something on this cluster, update the software that you're running on it. Um, it should be invisible to the user. There should not be anything not locally done to make, the, to make this happen. Um, if you want to update the OS, of course, if you do, want to do the underlay of the Kubernetes cluster and the OS, um, the only way to do this is to replace the, the, the drive. But this is also something that you could normally let a person do who has no IT experience. And uh, then, of course, backups would also go through the tunnel to the, to the central site. So I've played with this for quite a while. I found that um, a lot of the descriptions of how this is supposed to work are not quite what they are supposed to be, um, including K0S, which, uh, which is at the core of the whole thing. Um, the, it works very well if you know how to do it, but, it, uh, but the, if you follow the original, uh, the official uh, deployment guide, um, there are a few things missing, which I'm gonna, t gonna talk about in a few minutes. So what can this run on? Any kind of single board computer, server, whatever, basically whatever you can ship somewhere that has a, network, that has a power, uh, power core that you can plug in. And um, I mean, for, for expeditions or so, it could be something like a rugged um, laptop or a rugged, uh, um, some sort of rugged computer. I, uh, I just chose a Raspberry Pi because I had one lying around and because they are cheap and they're also um, useful for testing. I will provide uh, a guide of, on how I did the deployment. And uh, so if you want to try this out on your own Raspberry Pi, there's really nothing to, nothing to it that you need other than a Raspberry Pi, a plug and uh, ideally a keyboard for it. So um, we have a lightweight Kubernetes distribution. There is a bunch of them out there. I'm using K0S. Uh, this is our um, lightweight Kubernetes distribution, and um, I'm familiar with it. Uh, I, uh, I like the concept of being able to just download a single binary and uh, have a Kubernetes cluster built directly from there with, uh, with takes. Oh yeah, this is, this is a story I should probably tell. So I did something boneheaded when I was uh, st just starting to work on this. I built everything, and eventually I got, I got to the Kubernetes distribution, and I got the, the error message that the binary could not be run on the platform. So I looked, and I finally found out that the platform was actually ARMv7 instead of ARM64. So I thought, oh, oh, that's going to cost me another two days to fix that. And uh, I just went by the write-up that I did, and it took me less than an hour to actually make it work again from the, from the time that I, that I deployed to this, um, or copied the image onto the stick. So it is really not difficult to do once you, know, once you get around all the footfalls that you have. I'm basically just using Ubuntu 22.04, I'm using the a Raspberry Pi imager that, is, uh, that allows to do this, but uh, you can use anything at Balena, Etch, or whatever, you, whatever you're using for this. Um, OpenVPN, in our case, in this case, 
I'm VPNing into our company network because my um, my central site is a virtual machine that's running on our, on our corporate cloud. Um, but you could simply put the, the the whole thing onto a single machine that's sitting sitting somewhere on the internet. Uh, and then I'm using Lens to just show that you can access the the, um, the environment and, uh, and uh, that you can build this. So the deployment. First of all, um, I used the Raspberry Pi Imager to uh, to build the um, image. It has built-in uh, configuration. Wait a second, I may actually have this thing on here. So you basically can just choose an OS. Uh, yeah. It's here, general purpose here, OS, you have Ubuntu, and you can basically just ch choose this here. So um, the uh, installation is essentially pretty painless. The only thing that you need to, um, uh, to set up, uh, I recommend setting up the host name and then Wi-Fi credentials and login credentials if it, um, at least for, I needed those for the prototype. Theoretically, you should be able to build, eventually build this without, but this is not, it's not quite there yet. Then I boot the Raspberry Pi from the image make and make everything work. Configure OpenVPN. This is also um, pretty commonplace. Make, just make sure that it is actually starting after the um, uh, after the, the after reboot. Uh, the first couple of times that I tried it, the uh, after the after the reboot, the tunnel did not open, so it was a little bit of a of a fight there. But um, it, uh, this should be um, fairly fairly straightforward. And then you download and install the KZRS binary. This is essentially just. Uh, you go to uh, get.kzrs.h, uh, uh, um, get.kzrs.net, I think I did, I did that. Yeah, I'm, I'll also uh, um, dig that out and publish it. So um, that kzrs binary does essentially everything that allows you to build, un um, deploy, undeploy a cluster. Uh, and this, trust me, it, it, took, it took me about 20 times to get it work. So I, uh, on the same image, I stopped it, it uh, undeployed it, deployed it again uh, until I finally figured out what, uh, what the problem was. And the biggest, the biggest problem that I found was to create um, uh, or to make the tunnel interface work with the, uh, with the deployment because uh, normally the, uh, it chooses an existing network interface, either the Ethernet interface or the WLAN interface, and the tunnel is not taken into account. So what you have to do is you have to create a um, um, configuration file uh, that uh, has the tunnel IP directly um, placed into it as the API uh, IP, because if you do not do this, then uh, the API IP is going to be only available through the um, uh, on, um, it's only available uh, through the regular network interface, and that's obviously not what you want. So that configuration file, uh, you can, uh, this is essentially pretty simple. Yeah, well, let me see whether I can find this. Okay. Uh. Uh, yes, uh, this what this might be a very good idea. So this is, I think, this is better. Oh yeah. So why doesn't it work? Well, the easy, the, the simplest way is it is not actually plugged in. So let's see whether this will directly get us into uh, our build. There we are. Where are we 
Uh, we still have a little bit of time. Okay, so this should have time. Oh, there we are. See, this take, uh, takes always. The funny thing is that the user interface comes up, or the, the, uh, the shell comes up before it let, actually lets me log in. So, so this is uh, the, that um, specification that is used um, with K0S as a configuration file. And the important piece is that uh, address API address uh, thing. But I found, and this is something that I will have to address with the K0S team, is that theoretically it uses or, or it puts all the network interfaces into there. There's uh, an additional segment that uh, has all the other network interfaces. The downside to this, of course, is that, it, uh, that these are not, there's no uh, X509 certificate for them. And so they log in, the, uh, so the um, API access through that doesn't actually work. But as we do not want any other addresses to access our API anyway, this is the way to do it. So basically, they, they can even leave that extensions thing out, the basic, and even the network thing out. This only needs to have the, uh, the spec with the API and that address that, uh, is where the API is, uh, is going to be reachable. And this needs to be the address of the tunnel that you are, that you are using. So. Okay, um, and continue here. Where were we? Okay, so the next step is to configure, configure OpenVPN. You have the typically um, OpenVPN looks like uh, OpenVPN. Um, So this is a standard open VPN file that you probably get from your network administrator or you create it when you are building your own um, at a tunnel open, open VPN server. So that's that. Um, and also after the reboot, verify the tunnel operation. It's important to uh, make sure that it, that it does come up again. So um, to get Basically, I built it um, at, at home. And uh, when, I, uh, when I built that, uh, the tunnel um, always comes, uh, was built for the, to come up with that same network at, um, IP address, internal tunnel internal IP address. So when I moved it from there to my hotel room, um, the tunnel, uh, the IP address in the hotel room obviously was totally different. And also, obviously, you cannot um, either SSH or API connect into a hotel network. So that uh, VPN tunnel essentially go, gets me out of the network and into my network so I can actually ex access it regardless, pretty much regardless where it is. Um, so then download and install the K0S binary. This is um, this would, is configured with this um, K0s. So yeah, so this would be, for instance, uh, uh, the way that you uh, configure this. This is basically the K0s binary. When you download it, is inst uh, installed uh, in user bin. And then you do, uh, or use a local pin, I think. Um, and then you do 
uh, KZ Res install controller dash dash single that the single um, is uh, so you can run both uh, Kubernetes master and a Kubernetes worker on the same node. Um, and then that dash C cares KZ Res dot YAML is that, uh, so the configuration file is run to get your to get your tunnel interface. Okay, and so let's see. So if you have a crazy OS controller running, it's also configured that uh, the way that it will shut down and come up properly after the shutdown. And so if you were to talk to that directly on the node, you would see um, oh, yeah. So you can see that the, uh, the Kubernetes server is actually running. But of course, this is not very useful if you want to, if you have to, lose, uh, to, move, to log into the server to make this happen. So the next thing is to build a service that is started after all the other services on the system is extracting the, the, the uh, uh, Kubernetes configuration into a file and copy that file into our um, service. So basically, you would have uh, ah. so this is a, a just does a, um, creates a cube config from uh, that uh, Kubernetes cluster and then is copying it to here. So I give um, So now we are on the main server, and the kube config is in kube config dash obsidian. This is the name, the, the uh, um, host name of this guy. So So, uh, maybe, maybe we should look at all namespaces, otherwise we will see, not see the pods. Of course, you see here, you see the same pods. So, once this thing is configured, once the, the, the drive is configured, you can just boot it up anywhere, and it will automatically get your kube, kube config from the existing system to into here, and then you can use you can go one step further with well, the time wise anyway. I think I only have a few minutes left. Um, here I have actually loaded uh, that cube config already into Lens, so you can see that it, uh, that you can actually um, access the uh, access Lens itself. It also uh, this thing runs the lens provided um, monitoring. So if you look at cluster here, you can see the, um, the usage of CPU memory ports and so on, and uh, the graphs that go with it. And then you could, uh, could um, create a workload in there, like just uh, up, uh, upload any kind of Kubernetes workload that, uh, um, that you want to play with. So this is where we are at the moment. What's still open? First of all, uh, I want to get to the point where this can all be done in a way that we can just clone these images, um, run a simple script on them to, um, uh, to configure the uh, network credentials and the host name, and then uh, basically um, deploy this without having to ever log into the system. No uh, SSH, no nothing. 
And the other thing would be on the other side to build a CI CD environment that allows us uh, to actually deploy to a random arbitrary number of uh, Kubernetes servers that are somewhere out in the field. We do not know where, we do not know, want to know where, we just want to know, we just need to know the tunnel interface IPs which they are going to tell us whenever they are building, uh, whenever they are booting up uh, wherever they may be in the world. So I hope this was a little bit informational and a little bit instructional and a little bit of fun for you. And thank you very much. Any questions? Do you have the code uh, stored in GitHub where another person can go view it? Um, this is something that I still need to do at the moment. This, uh, uh, this is not there yet, but I'm going to plan. I'm uh, planning on putting this uh, up on GitHub, and I'm also going to provide um, uh, after the show, um, uh, or um, like in, in the next couple of days, provide a step-by-step -step list that I have, I have made for myself to build this, uh, is this environment. Anything else? Yes? So, I mean, is it, is it important that some workflows end up in the proper, you know, at the edge? The, the idea for this would be that you basically mass deploy workloads. Let's say you have 50 branch offices and they all need that same point of sale software that you want to, uh, want to um, deploy. If you, you can do this, of course, you can go to, the, to each of those edge sites and do this manually. And this is um, how a lot of companies uh, still work. The technician drives to the place, installs the software, and makes, it, uh, and makes things happen. But first of all, a technician costs money, um, quite a lot of money, actually. The second thing is that the technician only is available at a certain time. So um, if something goes uh, were to go wrong or so, um, uh, you, you cannot make a fix, put a fix in place until the technician has time to drive there. And the, th the, the third thing is uh, that also this is a, a fairly hefty security risk if you have, um, um, or in general, operational risk if you have somebody manually uh, uh, at these commands. If you can automate it to the point where you really do not need to touch anything, you say ship that device to the, to the place, they plug it in, they uh, boot it up, it automatically falls in line and you deploy that point of sale software. And if something happens, if, uh, for instance, um, you know, you know, a major bug is found in that software. You simply send the update through the same mechanism. That makes but the larger your environment is, and the more edge devices you have, the more money and time you will save to make, uh, to make this happen. So the second thing is, um, these things are uh, you can basically build something that is reasonably cheap. So you can simply ship a re ship a, or a replacement um, instead of having like a expensive servers uh, on. Um, in, in, store, in stock, so you can um, ship the server out. Let's say um, branch office 24 needs one, and you are not going to have one in each branch office. These things, if you, if you do it right, you can buy, build for a couple hundred bucks. Uh, you can actually have a second one um, in case something, something catastro goes catastrophically wrong to just take it out. It's like basically like your Wi-Fi router at home. If something goes wrong, uh, router gets, gets de destroyed, what do you do? You buy a new one and put it in. And this is kind of the same concept, to build, uh, to build something that is in, in a way disposable, that, is, uh, th th that you really do not have to worry about what do I do when, when, this, uh, when this thing dies. When this thing dies, we are just, just going to replace it. I'm not particularly fond of this throw away everything uh, society, but these are the things like that are reliable. And if sometimes something should happen at some point, then it's probably easier for you and most, much, much cheaper to um, throw it away and, uh, and simply put another device in its place than have somebody drive out there and try to fix it. So, yes? Uh, did you look at using like Kind as a containerized case deployment versus uh, K0? Um, I have not looked at that. Um, there's a, there's a certainly different ways uh, out, uh, out there to do this. But uh, what made me 
um, use case, or, or how I came to ca use K zeros. First, first of all, um, this is uh, I know Jose Numelin who is um, uh, running the K zero S um, uh, development. So it was a little bit easier. I had to actually ask Jose two questions during the dip, uh, during the build because um, I got stuck in in two places. So it was easier for me to make this happen. The second is, of course, um, this is the, the idea here is a concept. This is not um, supposed, to, uh, everyone is not supposed to build it the same way, that I, uh, but uh, it should show that you can build something that is so simple that basically go, go with the Apple principle. You want to be able to just, just make it work. And this is, uh, this is the idea here. If you want to do this with a different um, container distribution, absolutely. I mean... The, the thought there was just that you, then, you can then manage that uh, IP addressing for your... For your the, the, the idea was to essentially show that if you, with a little bit of effort you can build a device that does not require any kind of local knowledge or local um, skill set. Well, that's sort of what I meant by that containerized approach. If you use, if you use Kind or another containerized cluster, then you can virtualize its IP so it sees whatever IP address you decide at config time. That's, uh, the That's correct, but there's a downside to this. If you go somewhere, like let's say here, um, I would not be able to get to this um, from the outside. This is behind a firewall from our um, hosts from, the op from Open Infra, and they will certainly not let me um, uh, directly connect this to the internet so I can see an IP address. You would have to have some sort of netting so uh, you would uh, be able to see this device um, on the internet somehow. The, the, the idea with the, with the VP, with creating the VPN um, is that uh, you can basically, VPN works from nearly anywhere unless the um, operator of the firewall actually act actively blocks it. So this is um, so th that was that was the idea behind it, and this is also the same problem that our customer had uh, that they had Wi-Fi some sort of random Wi-Fi routers in their place, and uh, having those Wi-Fi routers, you really have no way unless you configure each and every one to actually let, let you in. Um, this is the only way to actually get get the IP address out there and allow you to get to get in. You could still do it with any any other kind of methodology. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so.